Yeah, we ha I have a photograph in my studio of O'Keefe wearing, uh, it's a Stieglitz, Alfred Stieglitz photograph of her wearing one of my grandfather's bracelets. And I still make that bracelet with the same tools that my grandfather made them with. So I call it my O'Keefe. Yeah. So I have Sam Patania here. Now, I've always called you Patania forever, mm -hmm. and I'm Patania mm -hmm. Jewelry, but I knew it was Patania. Now, you just said something very funny as we were starting. Since your prices went up, it's gone from Patania to Patania? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. But probably just sort of sliding over to the Italian pronunciation. Is that what Patania was very American. And how did your dad and grandfather, did they say Patania or Patania? Yes. They, they did say Patania. My dad did until my sisters and I started saying Patania, and then he's now he's Patania also. Okay, so I'm not crazy. That's good. No, well, not for that reason, Mark. Well, yeah, for other reasons, <laughs> that's true. But, you know, it's because I always had Patania jewelry, and then I think I heard you say Patania. I was like, huh, I've been screwing it up. No, but it's... It, no, most of, most of my life it was Patania. Yeah, so you're just trying to get back to more of your roots. Yeah. Which is the right. Italian roots. So let's... Right, right. Yeah, so we could even start there. That's a great place to start. I have Sam Patania on, or Patania. depends. I go Patania now. Um, whose grandfather came from Italy in 1899? Is that right? Uh, no, he came to the, to the U.S. He was born in 1899. So okay. he came to the U.S. when he was about eight or nine years old. And so, and they migrated from Italy. Why? America. From Sicily, from Messina, was hit by an earthquake and tsunami, uh, which killed uh, 200,000 people. Wow. And the government was paying for people to come to the United States. So that's how they got over here, through like, Ellis Island. Was that New like York 1907? City. Right. So that's interesting. April the 7th, I think, of 1907 was the busiest day ever through Ellis oh, oh, Island. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it was some amazing amount of people. I think like 100,000 people huh. came through in a single day or something to that effect. Um, no. Yeah, that was the height of it. Uh, and I wonder if that might have been part of this migration with things like this. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see where all those people came from. Yeah, I think I think they're all Europe for sure, Eastern Europe. Right, but Messina part. or from Sicily or Italy or yeah, Eastern Europe or... Yeah, that's fascinating. I know, right? And that was the day. And so he gets over in 1907, basically. Yeah, 1907, 08, I yeah. can't remember exactly. That's, yeah, that's when Maynard Dixon was, he first got to uh, to uh, New York as well. Oh, so that's they, interesting. They could have met. Huh. Uh, <laughs> and so your grandfather, and his name was, was it Frank, or did he have a different name? No, that was Frank. It was, you well, know, I bet Maynard Dixon and my dad and my grandfather met in Santa Fe. Oh, that's, I'm sure, and we'll get there. It would that's not surprise me at all. That's interesting. Um, yeah, because you, that store opens in 27, right? Right. Yeah, and Dixon's there in 31, so it's very, mm. very possible. And Dorothea Lang used to wear a bracelet that I would see in images that looked very much like a Patania bracelet. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So he comes over, and uh, he's just a kid, eight years old or right. so. Mm -hmm. And um, what, did his, what did his dad do? His father was already over in New York City. He was a cobbler. He was a shoemaker. So it was in the family to be working with hands. Uh -huh. But my grandfather had already started apprenticing to a goldsmith at that age. He in New already York? had some No, in Sicily. Wow. Yeah. So he kind of he was destined early. Yeah. Yeah. And so and and, and we're talking about this for a couple of reasons, not only cuz I want to hear about your backstory, but because he's one of you're a third generation silversmith, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, and he was apprenticed as a goldsmith. Uh, he did other work in New York City before he went full time into jewelry, other crafts. But then uh, got working with a company called Goldsmith and Stern, and uh, became a very young, in his late teens, jewelry designer for mm. this established company. In New York City, right. So and but but mostly in gold and platinum kind of work. Hmm. And has any of that? Have you ever seen any of that jewelry? We have a collection of rings that that he made, and they're they are very East Coast goldsmith kind of work. It's there's not really a lot of, you know, it wouldn't be able to look at those and say those are a Frank Patania, right. And did he sign them? He, did no, he... I'm sure he was using whatever the company had yeah. him using. Uh -huh. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so he stays in New York for his whole life? 
No, he uh, got tuberculosis. And that's uh, when he moves out. In his late teens, he came out to Santa Fe uh, in 24 Uh to recover from tuberculosis. And the reason he came out to Santa Fe was because of Goldsmith and Stern, the owner, Nat Stern, uh, had land out in Santa Fe. Hmm. And they just loved my grandfather. He was like a son to them. So Nat Stern had him come out to Santa Fe to recover from T- tuberculosis and he's 25 at that point right mm-hmm. yep and so he recovers mm-hmm. and does he meet your grandmother there uh let's see i don't know when they got married she was 10 years younger than him so it was probably later on bef- after he had started his own business um her story is amazing too she was coming out to meet up with her father as a 12 year old girl and on the train her mother died so she's the oldest of four, of four sisters. So there's all of a sudden these four orphans looking for their father, who then dies himself, and they're raised at, in Santa Fe at an orphanage. And what do they die of? Your grandfather's. On I don't know side. what my grand what my great grandmother died from on the train. Uh, my great grandfather was a coal miner. He was actually out in Gallup, and they were coming out to meet him, uh-huh. and under some miserable mining conditions and died probably of a lung ailment. And what would have these time frame been? Was this in like the... That was, well, she was 12. Uh, so yes. it was probably very close to the same time my grandfather came out. Okay, so he comes out in 25. I was just wondering because you have the pandemic flu too in 1918, 19. I was just right, wondering if right. that might have been part of the reason but it sounds like it was a little later so she's raised as an orphan right. in santa fe mm-hmm. and and she is what what descent was she of she was northern italian oh so both italian Interesting. yeah from either end of the of the boot and um and so they meet in Santa Fe and get right. married right wow. wow that's interesting so yeah. you have a really long history back to santa fe yes yeah because she's yeah, the 20s yeah very much so and so when when is your father so that's frank Junior, your dad's Frank. Uh, your this is your dad, and Frank Senior right. was your grandfather. And when is he born? He's born in 1932. Okay, and he's the second of their children. So probably 1930, they are married and having kids. Mm. And he's already got his shot by that time in 27. So he decides. Right. Your grandfather decides to break away from this other um, place in New York and set up his own shop. And does he call it? What does he call it at that time? Well, he worked for Gans for a while, mm-hmm. and then he started his own shop, which he called the Thunderbird Shop, mm-hmm. right there on the plaza in Santa Fe in 1927. And so the Thunderbird Shop was in 27. Right. That's, that's when it started. And why the Thunderbird Shop? Do you know why you use that? Um, I, it's a you know fertility symbol. It's just a very common symbol in Native American You know, Dixon cultures. used it too, so I'm just... Who? Maynard Dixon. Oh, yeah, interesting. He used a Thunderbird. Huh. Yeah. Uh huh. That was his emblem. That's fascinating. Yeah. And so, it's interesting that that he would have it. Dixon started using it early in 1896. Was the first time. Okay. We see that that logo of a Thunderbird, and so maybe he got it from Dixon. No, huh. or who knows? But yeah. it was just something he chose to do, and right. And so they had a big Thunderbird, um, kind of bird as the signage too. Right. Yeah, we have photographs of that store uh, with that sign in front of it. And is that where um, Mark Bate's store is now? Where was the original Thunderbirds No, store? it's uh, Maloof's is there now. Yes. Is that where it was? It was where yeah. Maloof's? Mm-hmm. Oh, so right There was in... one right off the corner, and then later in the 50s, he took over the corner store also. So he had that whole corner, caddy corner from La Fonda. Oh, wow. And then when did Packers come in? I think that was in the 70s. Yeah, because they took that corner. Right. Then. And they were there for a long time. Wow. And so so he takes the corner of in Santa Fe in the f- what year in the 50s, do you know? No, I don't. But it was early. We need to... We it have, was when my dad yeah. was doing his ROTC Army bit, so it would have been around 55. Mm. Yeah, because your dad was in the Army, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, he did a stint for ROTC. Yeah. And that was in the... It, around that time, 50, in the mid fifties. Yeah, I think he graduated high school in fifty, so he was out of college in fifty four, and mm-hmm. did a two year stint with ROTC. And so, when did your grandfather start using 
uh, his signature with that cartouche of FP in his? Uh, he, very early on, he did not have a hallmark. Then he started using a roller, a rocker engraved hallmark. But in order to do that, you need a big area. So on the back of his jewelry, oftentimes, there simply wasn't a big area to engrave his hallmark. And would it be engraved, rocker engraved with FP? Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have photographs of that and maybe examples. But then he had a stamp made, a couple different stamps, um, again, which were so large that it required a large area on the back of the piece to use. And then he had the FPs made. I think Dad said that didn't happen until the 50s. My dad's written an article about this that I that's available online. Mm -hmm. and where, would, where could people find that? Do you know? Um, if you go to my website, if it's not on there, I can, I'll, I'll get it to you. You put yeah. it on yours. Yeah, I'll put it on. Yeah, yeah. And so, but that's how, I mean, because that's how we always go, okay, this is a cartouche with FP. This is your grandfather. Mm -hmm. And those are the only ones that we really consider to be seniors work is if they have that cartouche. Is that true? Would you say? I mean, cause you see FP and the Thunderbird stamp, but I, I always kind of consider those more Thunderbird. Well, it's there. We divide mark. it into two categories. One is Thunderbird, uh, pieces that were made by the workers in his shop shot. So it'd have the shot <clears throat> mark of the Thunderbird. Right. And, and an FP yep. and a Sterling yes. stamp. But that doesn't always hold true. There are pieces, again, like I said, you need a certain amount of area on the back of a piece to mm. put any kind of hallmark on. Mm -hmm. So my de my grandfather would also use the small FP. Mm. For safety's sake, I say the cartouche is his personal hallmark. But this is why Dad wrote an article. You know, in those days, nobody knew it was going to go three generations. <laughs> right. So it, it kind of didn't matter. Right. Um, and it wasn't until the late 90s before the Stonewall Foundation show that I was beaten up by a client for not putting my hallmark on a piece. And he was a collector. Right. Not beaten up, but verbally. Abused. Yeah, slightly. <laughs> um, so it, and then it, at that point, it, I realized that this is really important for collectors yes. of three generations of work. And I we needed to get this straightened out. Yes. And so... Your father and your grandfather, but I guess first your grandfather, he started um, employing other silversmiths, native silversmiths, right? Very early on. Yeah. Yes. And some really great ones, too. A lot of them went on to have their own careers. Yeah. Can you list some of those people? Do you oh, I should them? have had my list in front of me. Um, we can always put those on there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to need to refer yeah, to Yeah, there's one of the a Hopi guy, which I can't remember who I... Uh, yeah, we're both. Louis LeMay. Thank you. Louis LeMay. That was one of them. But also... Um, Did Kenneth Begay ever do anything with your... There was Begay's, I don't know. Yeah. I know Louis was really one of the great ones that worked there. And so he would hire different... And Louis is a Hopi guy, but uh, he would hire Hopi and Navajos right. to work on the... But they were... His designs? You're, Absolutely. And in yeah. fact, most of these guys came to the family with no silversmithing experience mm. it's much easier to train somebody with no experience than somebody who thinks they know what they're doing mm. already mm -hmm. they're going to want to you know use their techniques so usually these guys came to the family even in my generation with mm -hmm. no experience at all and it's it's interesting when you look at a guy like Louis LeMay who I love his his work it definitely has a modern sensibility and he looked at things differently and I always kind of wondered mm -hmm. if that didn't come from all the time he spent with your grandfather. Well, most of these guys never really got away from my grandfather's designs. They were so strong mm -hmm. and sold well that it didn't, you know, most of these guys were not artists who are unwilling to uh, accept what they've learned and not modify it mm -hmm. into something that's their own. Mm -hmm. And that's been a struggle with my dad and me differentiating ourselves from the previous generation. generation. I don't want to look like my grandfather's work. Right. And neither did my dad. And I don't want to look like my dad's work. I want it to be my own. And I think that's what really differentiates an artist versus a craftsman. Mm -hmm. Most of those guys were craftsmen, even some of the ones that went on to make their own businesses and didn't really stretch past uh, Patania design. Mm -hmm. And so how does your father's work differ from... 
your your uh, grandfather's work? Uh, Dad really went modernist. It's very plain to see yes. if you see a body of his work. His, you know, he really fell in love with modernist design, and he, he was one of the early guys doing that kind of work and pushing it in that direction. And he's doing this in the 50s and 60s, too, and 70s, right? right? So, I mean, that's a natural time when we have pop art exactly. and all sorts of things going exactly. on. Exactly. And did he ever show any of his work? I know you guys have, or all three of you are in the Smithsonian and had a show that was in the Smithsonian, but did he, did he ever show his work in New York City other than just the Thunderbird, or did he show no, elsewhere? No, you know, my grandfather was very regional. He was in Tucson and Santa Fe. Dad took it national by getting into competitions, mm. so he would compete and be in various shows around the country. Mm -hmm. He had work, he has work that's in the uh, National uh, Cathedral in Washington, D.C., He's got collectors all over the country, but I don't think he ever had a show in New York City. In Dallas, I know, and and uh, um, but I'd ha I'd have to ask him about that. I don't know specifically. Or I will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I plan to once we get through Great. pandemic area. Um, so he's a much more modernist. Your dad is is your grandfather is taken his designs from Eastern European and kind of modified that with not native sensibilities being in Santa Fe. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, what, my, what I, desc I describe my grandfather's work as taking a platinum and goldsmith's way of working metal and turning it into silver. And that's not an easy thing to do because mm -hmm. silver moves much more much differently than platinum and gold. You, you can be very much more architectural with platinum and gold just because of the way the metal works. Mm. With silver, it has to be over-engineered so that it's not, because it's much more malleable than either of those other two metals. But it's definitely not Southwestern. He also brought in a lot of organic work that was not being done by the Native Americans at that time mm -hmm. till like the 70s when leaves are soldered onto everything. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see his leaves coming out in the 20s and 30s. Wow. And very organic. It's, it's much more Mediterranean, I think, than mm -hmm. Native Southwest. And one way that my grandfather worked was he, he had a group of craftsmen working in his store who he employed. He would give them the materials, the tools, everything, the design. He would teach them how he wanted these things made. And he, they would make elements which he would then assemble into his jewelry. So unlike my dad, and for the most part me, we made every, if it's got our stamp on the back, it's completely made by us. Mm -hmm. My grandfather worked much more like the old masters who didn't make every little piece. They had other guys making assistance. it. Assistance. Assistance, you know, even Michelangelo and, yeah. you know, well, farther they back than that. They'll do it today. Contemporary artists Absolutely. do it Absolutely. I do that today too, yeah. but I use a company that's not even in Tucson any mm -hmm. longer. Um and so his work is his work, but it wasn't entirely made by his hands. And he worked that way most of his career. And the people that were helping him, though, were pretty much all Native artists? Yeah. Yeah. Native or Hispanic. Yeah. And so when did he open the Tucson store? He comes to Tucson in 1937 and opens right next to the Fox Theater um, in 37. We've been here ever since. And why did he choose Tucson, do you know? Well, he was looking for a winter Get marketplace. Mm -hmm. Santa Fe is so very seasonal, it's summer. It dies in the winter. So he's looking for a place that will be open during the winter. Um, he's on his way to California, and he stops in Tucson and falls in love with Tucson. So he opens a store here. Yeah, it probably reminded him of Santa Fe, too, to some extent, I would imagine. Yeah, it was small community. And right. Just I everything. wish he'd made it to California. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> well, and the other thing about the um, Tucson is that at that same time, the Hispanic Society of Revival of Sp Spanish Culture was had a shop in Tucson as well. Hmm. They And about that same time, they were also in Santa Fe, and they come to Tucson as well. I wonder which one got there first at that's interesting. It was right about that same time. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I love this perspective because I don't, you know, the family doesn't have that perspective. Mm -hmm. And they were making uh, Chimayo kind of blankets, but in a revival style. They were reviving yeah. the old Rio Grande blankets, but using different yarns and boltos and things like that, and retablos that had been kind of lost. They wanted to to revisit this and. 
people like Mary Austin were involved in those kind of things. So yeah. they came to Tucson. They're in Tucson, Santa Fe, and your dad is in Tucson, Santa Fe, too, or your grandfather, I should say, at that time. Your dad mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. five, I guess, when he... Uh, right. And was your dad born in Santa Fe or Tucson? Yep. Santa Fe. Santa, Santa Fe. Hometown. And where were you born? Here in Tucson. Okay, so you got the Tucson. Did you spend time in Santa Fe growing up? Uh, just uh, hanging out with my cousins during the summer. I never lived there. Mm-hmm. And these are your father's brother? Father's sisters. Sisters, mm-hmm. okay. And so you never lived in Santa Fe? Nope. You're totally a Tucson yeah. raised, born and raised. Yep, yep. Um, and so when are you, when do you, when does your life start? Uh, 61, I was born in 61. 60, 61. And uh, dad, I think, was entirely down in Tucson at that point. My grandfather used to move the whole family back and forth between the two cities to follow the season. Mm-hmm. So dad would actually start a school year in Santa Fe and end up in mm-hmm. Tucson which he didn't like at all. No, I'm sure he hated it. Yeah, and so he didn't want his family doing that, so we all stayed here, me and my two sisters yeah. stayed here in Tucson. Yeah, we did that to our kids too, but we left. They were always, they would always come back to school like two weeks later or three, because we had to do Indian Market, right? Right. And you know, right. Tucson starts up like August 12th or something, and mm-hmm. Indian Market is third week in August, and it was like, oh, you're going to have to miss that first week of school. Oh, kids. that's interesting. Yeah, I, they always did, and... Uh, they didn't like us. For, the kids didn't care. They thought it was fantastic. But the uh, schools didn't like it. But we just said, well, if we don't do it, we can't pay your tuition. So. Ah, well, that works. <laughs> and so you're, um, so they do this back and forth. And your grandfather dies in like 66 or so? 64. 64. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so your dad's, thir- he's in his 30s. He's 32 at that point, I guess. So, And has mm-hmm. he started a family um she has you, right? Yeah, and my, older sis- my two older sisters. Okay. So there's three of you. Three of me. I'm the baby. Yeah. And did they? Did your sisters ever consider going into art or going into No, it's jewelry? funny because my grandfather, the business was very stratified. The women were in front of the house and the men were in the back of the mm. house. So, you know, it kind of didn't enter into anybody's mind that there would be women working in the back. And this was your dad? That was, that was my grandfather, but that's what my dad grew up with. Right, so it kind of seemed... But my that. sisters, uh, my sister, my young, my second oldest sister and I took classes from my dad in high school for high school credit. And she was a very good crafts person, mm-hmm. but she had other interests. She wasn't interested in the family business. And so your father, did he teach in high school or you just was no. able to do it? Via like special credit kind of stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. How was that, by the way? Um, <laughs> how old were he's you? A, he's a great teacher. Yeah. Um, so that worked out really well for us. I was a lousy student. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a great teacher. And so when did he teach you? What was that like? Junior high or high? school? That was high school. In high so school. I started jewelry when I was uh, a freshman in high school. And did you like it? Uh, not particularly. Um, it was a real challenge. One of the things that happens in the trades is that as an apprentice, you're watching a master working. Now, they've done this for right. a number of years, so they make it look really easy he's because a master to them a, it is easy. Yeah, and he's a master of a master. Right. So he does a demonstration for me. I go back to my bench, <laughs> and it's just a, a horrible disaster, time and year after year. you know, <laughs> It just took a long time to get the muscle memory to be able to really do anything so so usually when you hire somebody like that and i've had this experience myself you lose money on them for a while until they're able to actually start producing stuff the way you you need it done and so when you're in high school and you're doing this with your father did you think well as soon as i get out of this out of you know high school and going to college i'm never going into this kind of deal or was it just no the opposite? college scared me more than staying with my dad <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't even start going to college till i was in my 20s and then i never got a degree yeah and you were making uh, jewelry that whole time yeah mm-hmm. working side by side with him yeah i started full time the day after i graduated high school and were you ha- did you enjoy that i was very happy to do good work. Mm -hmm. So by that time, I had been working a while part-time through high school and then right immediately full-time after high school. And so my my enjoyment of the craft was to produce work that you couldn't distinguish between me and 
the Native American guy I worked next to for 20 years or my dad. Mm. So that was my goal. Sometimes I would achieve that, and then that would, I really loved that. Mm. And who was the guy that you were working, the Native American guy? Uh, he was uh, uh, Pima. His name was Dan Enos, and he worked for my grandfather, my dad, and he ended up his career working for me. Wow. I'm... He worked for 42 years for the family. Wow. And then he passed away? Yeah. Wow, 42 years as a Phil Silver. Did he ever do any of his own, or he always... He did, did his own. Uh, he was very hesitant to tell people what he did because then they would want him to make a ring, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to do that kind of work. He made pieces for his family. He made some work for Mark Batty, um, but he really wanted to just be a craftsman mm -hmm. and not a designer. And so his work looks very, very much like Patania work. And can you tell these, when you see these bracelets or these pieces of jewelry, can you tell who made it even without looking at the mark? Can you go, oh, this is his work or this was uh, Louis LeMay's work? Or uh, You know what? Dan taught me that certain guys like his brother-in-law, who also worked for 40 years for my family, uh, Jimmy Harold, um, configured the way they stamped the hallmark on the back in certain ways. So Dan taught me that so I can sometimes winnow that out. But to the family, it just doesn't matter. It's all Patania work. Right. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. I'm just curious as a somebody going who wants to know the, the finer details. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's very hard to winnow out. Yeah, it is, even to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Now, did your family ever do a, something for George O'Keefe? Yes. That's what I thought. Tell me about that. Yeah, we ha I have a photograph in my studio of O'Keefe wearing... Uh, it's a Stieglitz, Alfred Stieglitz photograph of her wearing one of my grandfather's bracelets. And I still make that bracelet with the same tools that my grandfather made them with. So I call it my O'Keefe. Yeah, and did she wear that bracelet quite a bit? I don't know. You know, I have several photographs of her. Maybe she put it on and took it off yeah. immediately after the photograph, but I doubt it. I'll have to show you some pictures of Dorothea Lang with the bracelet she has on, because it really has a kind of a Patania look to me. Yeah, now all those people, and of course sitting here talking to you, the names slip my mind, but they all came to my grandfather's store in Santa Fe. When Los Alamos was up and running, Oppenheimer was an acquaintance of my grandfather and a friend of my great aunt. Fermi was shown around Santa Fe by my grandfather because he was one of the few Italian speakers in the town. Mm. So any poet, artist, all of them came to my grandfather's shop. And so that and that was during the Manhattan Project, Project Y. Yeah, so that was until the 40s. But I mean, even the yeah. 20s and 30s, this was happening. Uh, Georgia O'Keefe would come in and the story is she would leave her, pa she would be shopping around town and leave her packages in behind the counter at my grandfather's <laughs> shop so she could continue shopping. Wouldn't it have been nice if he traded a little drawing or something for <laughs> No, maybe he did. I just never knew about it. Maybe it's at my cousin's house. I don't know. Well, and when he he gets to the corner, and that's in the early 50s? Mid-50s. Mid-50s. I mean, that's the primo spot in Santa mm -hmm. Fe, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody had to go into the Thunderbird shop. Mm -hmm. So he must have sold a lot of jewelry over the years. Yeah. Uh, now, a lot of this is due to my grandmother, who never gets any credit for this kind of stuff. Yeah, she she came from nothing. She, and it's got a bad name now, but she was a social climber. Mm. And she was would throw parties. They would attend parties together. My dad says my grandfather would rather stay at home and play pinochle with my Uncle Pat, Carmelo Patania, who also had a store here in Tucson. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that wasn't going to happen. She was going to go out and, and socialize. And so this is how the business got started. Without her, yeah. the designs mean nothing. Without the designs, the socializing meant nothing. So it was it all just fit together. They were a team. They were a team, absolutely. And my great aunt Miranda was a, was a character around Santa Fe. She would drive in a convertible with her two standard poodles with sunglasses <laughs> oh my on. Oh, God. So, you know, she was, she was very much active in meeting all all the artists. She had a, a round table in the La Fonda where they would all meet every afternoon. La Fonda, she had a table at the La Fonda where everyone would meet in the afternoon. So all her friends, this was your... Her friend, you know, scientists, aunt? authors, poets, painters, everybody. Wow. Yeah, it must have been just a golden 
and did, time. And does your dad remember all those kind of things too? Uh, he's uh, he's the one that told me about that, so he probably, I'm sure he does. He probably went, yeah. You know, but to him it was family. It wasn't, you right. know, O'Keefe was just another person around Santa Fe. Right. To him it, it wasn't like, oh, everybody doesn't know George O'Keefe. <laughs> you know, it, it he, he didn't know any different. Now he realizes what was going on and right. really has an appreciation for it. Well, and he's kind of a kid at that time, too. I mean, right, right. When she, she gets there, I think about 31, and he's born in 32. And, yeah. And yeah. then, so when did your grandmother, when did she pass away? Your dad she died dies. in 74, 10 years. She ten was years. 10 years older than my yeah. grandfather, and she died 10 years later. Oh, she was 10 years older, too? Uh, 10 years younger. I'm oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. And she was the orphan. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so she. And she died in Santa Fe? Uh, she died in Boise, Idaho. Hmm. She had remarried after my grandfather died. Uh, yeah, she sounds like she was a pistol. Oh, she, she was a very elegant woman. She was his best model. Yeah. Uh, they did fashion shows in La Fonda with clothes. I don't know where the clothing was from, but uh-huh. they would have uh, the jewelry on. You know, she was a big part of the business. And has anybody done a book on your family? No, we have one in the work started with Kim and Pat Messier just yeah, this past week. Yeah, and they're week. and they're going to start. They're going to do the whole shebang. They're going to do. Well, the, we're we're just started working on yeah. it, so it's. I think it's important when you do something like that, not just to have it all only about the jewelry, you know. Cause, well, I've told them. I've hammered that point yeah, home because, about the women of the family were so important yeah. to the business. Yeah, the whole thing. I mean, the Lafonda. You know, that's super interesting. And maybe, yeah, yeah. and you know, knowing Oppenheimer and yeah. you know, all these amazing nuclear physicists and things that were yeah, going on. Yeah, my great aunt had a story where she was actually on stage at the La Fonda for a show and she was arrested. She was an Italian immigrant, but her paperwork wasn't properly done. Mm. So she went in front of the judge who knew her. <laughs> she was like, what, what are you doing here, Mirandi? And she told him the story and she's like, oh, get out of here. <laughs> and this is but your... this was during the war when this... being Italian yeah. was not cool. You oh, were, yeah, that's true. You I... know, and, La, and Los Alamos going on, it was a very high security area. Yeah, that is true. I hadn't even thought about that with Mussolini and all that. Yeah. 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 And were they persecuted to being Italian in Santa Fe? I mean... You know, they would fit in, you know, just kind of skin color and things I would well, think would be. Well, that was a point that I brought up with my aunt. And, uh, you know, because he was not a white man. He was a Sicilian, dark-skinned, yeah. you know, if he's a gardener, so he's out in the sun, so he's darker than if yeah. he had an office job. Right. And what did that mean? Because he fit into all areas of society. And in Tucson, it was even more stratified stratified Hmm. um but he she said he could pass which just raised my hackles (laughs) and it does right now as i'm saying that you know i was like wow you actually just said that (laughs) um i don't know how he his personality won people over he was just loved by everybody when he died you know, I never really knew him because I was three when he died. Yes. But I learned through Danny, you know, who I work next to. And all the guys that worked for him loved him. He helped them get started in business, buy houses, all these things. He wasn't a autocratic boss by any yes. means. Well, the fact that somebody like Oppenheimer would be able to talk and spend time with him, which, you know, they were, you know, there, there were G-men following everybody around mm-hmm. in Santa Fe at that time. And the big hangout, of course, was La Fonda. So, mm-hmm. you know, he had to feel very comfortable about who he was dealing with and just from optics, and clearly he didn't care. You know, some yeah. his personality. Yeah, my grandfather about, had a third grade education. Mm. Yeah, but he had a graduate school degree in silversmithing right. as far exactly. as uh, earned the hard way. Yeah, and this fantastic wife who's, you know, yes. keeping everyone stirred up and coming around and yeah. going to their houses. And, and she's a Santa Fe and for all you know, purposes having grown up in an orphanage there. Right. Yeah. So she, yeah, get, yeah. she gets it. And, but you never felt like you should go back to do something in Santa Fe. Um, I'd love to, but I started my family here in Tucson. So, you it's know, I have happen. deeper roots here. And so when did they close the Thunderbird shop in Santa Fe? Do you remember? Um, I hope he's writing all this down and we've talked about this. There was a period of time when there was no Thunderbird shop up there where my aunt, and her husband ran a business that used to be Thunderbird Shop, and then they went back up there and restarted the Thunderbird Shop. And that was late 60s, 70s time period. And then it closed in when, do you know? 
Uh, it's you know it's probably been ten years by now when Dad yeah. retired and closed that shop. And was that up in on Canyon Road? No, uh, one nineteen East Palace Avenue. Oh, that was the one that Mark Scott. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. Palace Road. Yeah, right close to where Oppenheimer one oh nine Palace, yes, where exactly. they would check in. Yeah, that's a great book for the thing. Yes, it is for those who were talking about one oh nine Palace Road, and it just talks about uh, you know McGovern and all the intricacies that will happen. Yeah, so and, they, you know, they were very close, just a block away uh, uh, oh, yeah. opposite the La Fonda from that address. Yes, <laughs> which is where the Rainbow Man is now, actually. Right, 109, okay, 109, okay. 109, yeah, Bob Capone. That's right, yeah. That one. So you grow up in Tucson. Mm-hmm. You graduate from high school. You start right away. Mm-hmm. And so when do you start developing your own kind of style that you go, okay, this is a Sam Patania? Well, I, I really apprenticed for 10 years with my, my dad before I was encouraged to design but he he still had the lifestyle of going back and forth between tucson and santa fe Mm -hmm. so he would leave for several months during the summer and i would get people coming into the store wanting to order pieces so i was pushed up front by the employee other employees to the counter and okay here do it so i had to learn (laughs) like that yeah um of how to deal with customers and design what they wanted. So I was designing in that way. And then I sort of, you know, got a few pieces of my own, started make being made, making myself and, and just started that way. And so you're about 28 when you start doing this. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And then when do you really go, okay, now this is me and I'm my own person. I'm doing my stuff. And you know. I started doing the technique of repose. Yes. And Dad taught me how to make this buckle. But he's always busy. He's not standing over me like a teacher in a teaching situation would be. He can show me a few minutes, and he's got to run off and take care of a customer or do bookkeeping or, you know, right. stuff that a business person needs to do. So I'm stuck there pounding on the silver, and I go way too far, and it's just a big mess. And he's like, oh, I should have stopped you you know, an hour ago, (laughs) but I fell in love with that technique. And that's really what I started doing that I made my own, which was repose, which is pushing it out from back. Yeah. Stretching it out from the back and up pitch bowl. Yes. And so ancient, ancient. Yeah, it is. And we see it in early ingot bracelets for the Navajo. We love to see those big repose pieces. So you started, that kind of becomes your first technique that starts branching me off. And then now your both your grandfather and your father used very good stones and coral. Mm-hmm. And when did they start doing that? Right off the bat? Uh, I I don't know the history of coral before the mid fifties when my grandfather actually took a trip to Italy. His only time he went back to his home country mm-hmm. with my grandmother. They went, took a trip to and went to Torre del Greco and bought pounds of cut coral italian pot. cut mediterranean coral that i still have a few pieces of you know what 50 years later right more, more. Than 50 years later yeah closer to so 80s. um that's when coral really comes in and that in the also, 50s in the 50s and that also you know a lot of guys a lot of his employees went off to fight in the war they came back and started working for him again there was a, the economy was good, so there's a lot of jewelry produced in the 50s for those couple of reasons, and mm. a lot more coral in our work. Yeah, because I guess I kind of think of that 50s stuff as being coral, a lot of the coral stuff, even early 60s, even mid-60s, I guess. Yeah, prior to that, I just, I haven't really seen any pieces that I can ID as right. 40s or even 30s. In and fact, there are very few of those pieces that I've ever seen. Yeah, it's beautiful coral every time. It's just mm-hmm. like... And drop dead coral. Yeah, my dad took a trip, to, and he should probably tell these stories, took a trip back to Torre del Greco with the old invoices that my grandfather, per, you know, from that original purchase and showed the guys who were running it right. then, and they all laughed about how cheap it was. And, right. You know, of course, now it's yeah. out of sight. Well, and soon we won't have any coral. It's all and I have out. pledged to not purchase any more coral. I haven't pl- bought any coral in 10 years. I, yeah. Because it's... You know, it's just not ecologically yeah. possible. Well, acid rain and acidification of the oceans are Yeah, there's no coral it. in the Mediterranean yeah, that I know ble- of anyway. Bleaching it all out and killing it all. So we're, we're, it's, a, it's 30% of the bio, biome, I think, in the ocean is coral-related. So yeah. we have some issues. Yeah, and red coral seems to be with the slowest-growing 
Yeah, it can take forever. Yeah, yeah. And then, but they also use great things like number eight stone and Lone Mountain and different things, Bisbee and all they that. They had right? trays and trays of it. And did they recognize <laughs> early on that they needed to have the best of the best kind of turquoise, or they just liked the colors? I think that that's just what was around. Yeah. But in order to do the set work that my grandfather does, you know, with clusters of stones, you need to have five times that amount to be able to pick a set out of it. So that's why he just had tons of turquoise. What was his favorite to use? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. It seems like it's always high-grade stuff. You know, in my grandmother's collection of jewelry, I think he would probably put his favorite, and there is a lot of number eight in there. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I mean, I even bought a bunch of number eight from you. We got rid of it a little bit. Yeah. I still have it. See, I'll use it when I want to get something made, and I'll bring it back to you. Great. Great. <laughs> and so by the mid-30s, you've designed your, you've done the repose work. You've got now mid, your, mid. I mean, the by your mid-30s. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, not 1930s, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. by your mid-30s. You're starting to do this. And then you get into some very more uh, contemporary modern designs yourself. Yeah, I oscillate. My work is very, I think it's very easy to see my grandfather and dad's influence. In yeah. Me. They're absolutely my greatest influence. And then like Spratling and Jensen. And, I can see that. Um, so I get to go back and forth between, I do vine pieces and organic pieces, and I also do very modern pieces. I've combined those two things, and I've taken, you know, I went to the university and uh, learned from Michael Croft different things that my family didn't ever use or mm. even know about. Like what? Mokame and um, mo basically that. And I'd been a silversmith for 10 years by the time I went and took college courses, and I've taken uh, workshops and stuff like that to to branch out farther. Mm -hmm. Well, you've taught silversmithing, and too, And I've right? taught for yeah. years. Forever, right? Yeah. You're a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right <laughs> and um do people come to you and go okay i want to uh do commissions or do they i mean we of course we represent you and we sell your work in our gallery um but you also do like some special order kind of things don't you uh i did a lot as a younger man to be honest you're gonna be getting my best work i always you know if somebody comes to me and they want something that i don't do right like, you know, I want an animal, hand carved animal. Well, I don't do that kind of work, and I don't even try any longer. As a younger man, I would have tried to accommodate. Right. Because I wanted to explore that, or or we just needed the business, or this and that. But now my I tell people that my the best use of me is to let me work. Right. And that's what I bring to you. Yes, yes. Yeah, we get some great stuff. I mean, and, we've had and some And the minute somebody stuff. else gets involved in designing, I get cranky and <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's i think that's true for any of the artists that we have it's very difficult to um when you start telling an artist what you need to do color wise or design wise or Got i want to see this takes all i think it takes the joy out of it for one Absolutely. thing and uh and then the worst case scenario it does you don't like it and if the client doesn't like it then you're stuck with something you didn't want to do to begin with that you don't care about yeah, what yeah. do you do with it? Yeah, you, you know, tear it apart and start again, I guess. You right. go with the stones. Yeah, I'm whatever. able to do that. A painter's not really able to do that. Yeah, they scrape it usually. Huh. Or they just say, okay, this is bloop. You know, so most of my artists won't do commissions. There's a few that can do it. And I'm very careful about who I will uh, hmm. bring to somebody with, you know, if they have expectations of I want this horse and a, this barn and this like oh. now a craftsman will love to do that kind of work yeah and i work with people like that right but i don't do that kind of work myself and it's probably exactly the way my grandfather felt too mm -hmm. you know, have them make all these bezels for this hundred piece cluster of turquoise you know he's not going to sit there and make those why should he yeah well it's not a good use of his time either. right and you want to do design. Mm -hmm. And do you have, did things come to you and go, okay, I have an idea that I want to try. Or is it you're making something and you go, I think I could do this differently. I've never tried this and do it this way. Are those yeah, both process? of those happen to me. And, and I just, you know, I'll see something that I have never seen before of my grandfather's. Mm -hmm. That'll get me going. Or dad's. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't even know they did that. That's amazing. I want to try that. But I want to make it my own. Right. I or would, a stone will inspire me. Mm. Or and is the shape of the stone more than the the color? 
that does? No, it'll be the color. Yeah. Yeah, the shape is sort of incidental. Interesting, because I've often seen bracelets and things, not just maybe yours, but have an odd shape or something. It feels like to me that the smith has taken the, that stone and worked the design around the shape of mm-hmm. the stone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because it's a great stone, but it was an odd shape. Have you done that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And sometimes I impose the silver on the stone into the silver. Mm. You know, it's it just just depends. And you also work in gold. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you have a preference? I love eighteen karat gold, and I love working with platinum. Just as a craftsman, those are really fun metals for me to work with. They're very much like silver in the way they move. Mm. And what's the difference between working in gold and platinum versus silver? Well, the stakes are a lot higher yeah. because of the price. Right. You know, it's ten time, easily 10 times more expensive to make these purchases. So I, you, I tend to get very, or people tend to get, craftsmen tend to get much more conservative with those metals just because of the cost. Makes sense. So there's a lot of boring gold and platinum jewelry out there as far as I'm concerned. Now, I have these fantastic number eight stones that I wouldn't put in silver mm-hmm. just because, you know, it's like putting a diamond in silver. It doesn't make any sense. Right. But I don't want to just make a, you know, a conservative piece around it. So it's tough. It's a tough balance. I don't know if anybody else gets it or not, but I'm compelled to do these pieces. Yeah, I would think so. It's being an artist again. Right, I, right. You know, I mean... Why do you do it anyway? I mean, you're exactly. <laughs> I yeah. mean, if it's not if it doesn't compel you, um, then it's, it's not going to get done. Yeah, and it's a job then, right? You know, and there's probably other jobs that are be easier and make more money. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, it's hard yeah. to be a silversmith, right? I mean, oh, it's hard to be an artist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you've it's been not been lucrative. Yeah, have you know? You're probably your grandfather may have done as well as anyone just because of where he was located in time. And his wife. He had this yeah. team that he was working with. It wasn't him alone. My dad and I were never able to put that together ourselves <laughs> and have this kind of a... Duo. Right. You know, the, your best model, is you're married to your best model. That's fantastic. Yeah. And she's bringing in clients. Right. Yeah. She's she Her compulsion is to bring in clients. Right. Well, she wanted to live well and she did. Have her she table. wanted to provide for her family. She yes. didn't want her family to go through what she went through. Yeah, and she not only is an orphan, but she goes through the depression. Oh yeah, and, and World then World the war, war and yeah. You know, it was that's it was a motivator. Not, yeah, it was not easy times. I mean, I think we get a sense of what that was like when what we're going through now. As a country, I don't think we've really gone through something like this. 9-11 was the closest thing, right. but it's still not being locked down and everything is changing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Whether it's I agree. Sporting events or how you hug or touch or all those things. Yeah. You know, you really get a sense. And, and we're, we're going to do it for a short term comparatively. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at World War II and they're having to be on yeah. rations. And Guys are for four years yeah. going off and dying and not, yeah. never being seen again. And just what you had to do at home with, you know, you can't use this metal. You can't right. have gasoline. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to do this. You have to do that. And um, Yeah, it's interesting. I have all the old templates or patterns from my grandfather. Mm. And during the war, they're using cardboard, and diff- they can't use me- they can't use sheet copper. There's no sheet copper to be had. Right. So there's this period of time where even in the the patterns, the templates that these guys used were made from different materials because of the war. Yes, and I I imagine he may have had a trouble trying to get silver and things. Yeah. To make jewelry. And his workers went off to fight. So yeah, you know. that had to be a very stressful time mm-hmm. for him. And who wants to buy jewelry? Right. Yeah, you know, not a lot of fun being had. Yeah, you have to become friends with the people up in Los Alamos because they're the ones with jobs and discretionary money. Plus, they're interesting people. Yeah, they're super well, smart. Well, some of them are. I mean, I bet all of them were. Yeah, I bet so too. I bet they were all very interesting people. Yeah, they were brilliant and uh-huh. um, driven. Passionate, passionate yeah. people are interesting, and from all over the place. A lot of them were European too. Yeah. They weren't mm-hmm. just Americans. No. And so now, where are you in the process? You've been doing this now for, what, 40 years? Yeah, Yeah. 40 years. So where are you in this process of your career? Well, I think I'm doing some of my best work, which is encouraging. You know, my hands and eyes still work. Um, 
you know, I'm building this other part using this workshop in Rhode Island to do work um, of the Patania collection, which are designs of all three generations that have always sold well. Yeah, classics. Classic work. And then I've also got my artwork, which you carry. Mm -hmm. And I love both worlds. I just love both worlds. So I get to, again, switch between those those two areas, and I just really enjoy both of those. Um, so that's where I am. I, you know, I get to bring you interesting pieces. Right. And because of this uh, coronavirus environment, I think I'm probably going to be bringing you more of my work than I ever have. Yeah, well, it makes sense. We have a broad market. We don't re- require people just walking in the door. I of our can't website. do your job. I've finally figured that out. <laughs> and I, I can't, can't do yours. I just can't, and i got to stop trying. Yeah. Well, artists, the thing they do best is make art. And the ones I think that do the very best are also those who find really stable, well-run galleries with longevity. Which don't exist all over the place. No, those they're hard. are very rare. Yeah. No, it's, it's hard. And it's hard to get into those sometimes. Uh, or you have to get a gallerist to believe in your work enough to go, this is really, I need to have this individual in my gallery, uh, and I want to support this person. Yeah, it isn't easy. It's no, really, it's, it's really very, very rare to have a gallery that you can trust, and it's taken me a long time to come around with that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's right. I mean, galleries ripped off a lot of people oh, over yeah. years, and they still do. I mean, yeah. and you're yeah. giving them silver and gold. <laughs> and stones. Are... And stones. <laughs> Yeah, and we actually recognize the stones as well. Yeah, that oh, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Nobody knows how to to sell those because they just don't know what it is. Yeah, and those are just amazing things. And um, I think so. They are. I think so. You know, I mean, that's one of the most important po- components. One of the components of the of a piece of jewelry. It's not just is it a beautiful jewelry is it well composed but did they take the time to think out the stones what kind of stones grade them correctly put them together and recognize well those are all bisbee (laughs) and really good bisbee that's you know yeah and growing up in this you know i'm extremely spoiled i teach people some young people come to me wanting to do this Mm. for a living right and um they just don't have any of the things that i always had you know, I'm extremely lucky to have been born into this family and then come to appreciate doing what the family did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've I'm got extremely a... lucky and grateful to what for my dad and grandfather's work. I love it myself, and yeah. I love doing it. I tell my dad fairly regularly, I'm so happy that he taught me the trade. And yeah. that's how we talk to each other. To us, it's a trade. Yeah, well, it is. Yeah, just like mine, job's a trade, too. You know, it's and is there any little Patanias that are that are my son? oldest son is twenty six, and he was not encouraged at all by the family to get into jewelry because it is a tough road to hoe. Right, and you know, he's like, "Well, if you're struggling, why should I do that?" <laughs> so we'll see. But he's making jewelry. I think jewelry. he loves it. I think he really loves it. But if it was. It had a path to being more lucrative. He would go for it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to think outside the box and do something differently, and um, you have to mass market things to make it at a different level than just a, an art form. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's only two ways to make more money: is the art has to get more expensive, or you have to be able to sell more of it. Mm-hmm. And you know. The one that gets more expensive, which is really what you've done for the most part, is to try to just continue to work on your craft, continue to be a better artist, make more things, get known, get in galleries, blah, blah, blah. And you've done that very successfully. And then the other part, or do a mass marketing, which you've also are working on somewhat as well, is things that you can sell in large numbers. Yeah, I'm shooting at both, but I'm high-end silver, which is a weird place yeah. to be. Yeah, that's probably true. So uh, have your son come by. I'll talk to him. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it couldn't be any worse than anything I told him. So. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you can, he sees it only from your perspective, and I can That's see it true. from a different perspective. Okay. Uh, you know, he may, you know, he may want to make silver, but he may want to be in the business. I mean, you can be a business person and have the same joy and do well. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. 
uh, for years, I, decades, I scoffed at the business part of it. But as I get older, it just you know it'll kill you if yeah. you don't succeed in that area. You have to succeed in that area. Yeah, yeah. Because if you or else, what have you got? It, you know, it's just the same thing with my grandfather and my grandmother. She, you know, she succeeded in that area where he would rather play pinochle with Uncle Pat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Well, I think that's something that artists can take away is is finding the giving yourself the ability to say, okay, I can't do it all. Mm-hmm. or I can't do it as well as this other individual, and I don't mind giving them a part of it. No, it's, it, it's expensive not to be able to do it. Yeah, because you, your, your reach is so much greater. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just the reach that we get on our website, forget just walking in the gallery, but it's huge. It's massive. And, uh, and we can do things like this. And that know? didn't come out of a thin air. That was a lot of hard work. Yeah, no, it took time to learn, the, on my end, the business of what needed to be done as well and what works. And for me, again, the most important thing on, in an artist, for me personally in my gallery, is do I like their work? That's number one. And then number two, do I like the person? Because it's, if I don't like the person, it's harder for me to sell the work and harder to want to help them. Because I want to have it more as a like a family, as a sense that I'm doing something great. No, I'll tell you what. Artists. When you had that 25th anniversary, yeah. mm-hmm. that blew me away. You had a room full of artists who loved you. Yeah. What gallery owner has that? Yeah, it was special. None. Yeah, I'm I sure they are out there. To even say that there are galleries out there that do have that same. Uh, they do have that same uh, sense of they family. They are far and few, but they're few and far between. There's no doubt yeah. about that. Yeah, it's harder to do it. Yeah, I think coming from a different field um, and choosing to be an art gallerist versus going, this is something I make money in. I chose it because of the art. I think that made a big difference. We well, have a passion for yeah, it, but you I, also have a business sense. I do. I think yeah. I do. Yeah, and it sure didn't come from my dad. <laughs> huh. Okay, <laughs> my father had zero business sense huh. at all. None. Uh, ever, you know, he was a research scientist. No, so it was, it's not 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 yeah. uh, given that you will have. I uh, don't have it. Well, I've my grandfather tried. had it. Huh? He, he was a peddler, basically. You know, he could buy a salesman. Stuff. He was a salesman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, in in, in Arkansas, and so hmm. in Depression, he traded chickens for. You know, I'll give you. I'll trade you this chicken. You do the roof, and we'll do this, and I'll take hmm. some of the eggs, kind of thing. So. I think those things can skip a generation. It clearly did with my father, who uh, I would laugh about. Uh, some of the, you know, he'd go in and buy a car and wouldn't negotiate at all. Yeah, that sounds like me. And, uh, <laughs> and he would say, and I love him for it, but he would say, you know, he needs to make a living too. And I'm like, well, he's still making the living, father. He just doesn't have to make it all off of you. Right. So, you know, please let me have some say in this. I'll help you a little bit. I'll, you know, be able to talk to him on a different level. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you find your skill set, like I can't paint. I'm not a painter. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do um, what you do as a silversmith, as an artist. But I know enough to be able to look and understand how difficult some of the things that you do are. Um, And I've educated myself in that sense of looking at the objects. So... You no, know, it makes it a. If you have a passion about the things, how are you going to. Well, I guess there are people that sell things that they're not passionate about. They do. There are. There's a lot of them out there. Well, know? maybe in the passion is the sale is the passion. I don't know. Yeah, I think that might be right. But it always just shocks me when a gallerist doesn't have any art, so to speak, at their home. I mean, just. Oh, oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, they have some, but they don't have anything good. Oh, no, no. I sold that. I could easily sell it. I want to sell it. No, huh. It's like, really? Wouldn't you? <laughs> You want to take that home? <laughs> That's the one I want to take home. And they just like they have a very minimal art collection. They just sell everything. Alan Stone was just the opposite. Who had Stone Gallery in New York City? Who represented Wayne Tebow? And he he kept, couldn't sell, or he didn't want to. sell. He didn't want to sell. Oh. He was a lawyer by training, and he was one of the greatest art gallerists ever. Hmm. And he collected everything. Huh. And Wayne Tebow, who was a very famous modernist, you know, some would say pop artist. He wouldn't. Um, he collected all his art and when his, and he sold it, but he collected it. And when his estate was worth over a billion dollars by the time when he passed away. <laughs> I hope his kids appreciated that. Oh, I think they did very yeah. much so. Yeah. Cause he probably raised him in that way that to love art. Right. You know, yeah, if it's around, you're going to love it. And you see the passion in your parents or your father, especially of what it's, you know, 
why it is. I'm sure your son has an innate love of jewelry. Uh, yeah, he and certainly has an probably. appreciation of it. Yeah. yeah, right? Way more than his peers, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And he's made some, so he knows what it took. And he's mm-hmm. watched you make a ton and right. his grandfather make a ton. And so what's he doing now? What's he at this moment? Um, he's part of a care team for my mother who was diagnosed with uh, d- dementia. Yeah. So he's part of her care team. Yeah, that's a hard home. And she's fortunate to be able to pay a care team. Yeah, so he nice. sits in there. That's fantastic to have him there oh, to, yeah. to help her too. Yeah. Somebody in the family. Yeah. 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 So yeah, he's at that malleable stage too. At twenty six. Yeah, twenty six. Yeah. So he's he's still tr- just trying to find who he is. Yeah. So I don't think we all find that. You're lucky in a in a lot of ways because you found it so early. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it took me a long time to fall in love with it. Like I wouldn't do anything else. I'm sure there's some of that you want to fight it a little bit. You know, I don't want to do what my dad and my grandfather did, especially in your teens and 20s. Yeah, family dynamics. Yeah. You know, I was not an easy kid to raise. <laughs> Let's face it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it took me a long time to fall in love with the with the business. And you probably can't imagine doing anything else. I could, I, I'm completely unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Un, I, there's no circumstances that somebody would say you're the person we're looking yeah. for. Uh-huh. <laughs> then you truly are an artist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is by default. <laughs> all artists are that way. Yeah. Uh huh. That's what they do. That was fun being in that room with all those artists yeah, because right? I have never had that experience in my life and here's a bunch of people going through what i'm going through yeah, they're you yeah just different media fascinating yeah so it's just a different media yeah they're exactly you yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, and they're all it's interesting to talk to them all during this pandemic to see how each one you know is dealing with it you know most are introverts anyway mm-hmm. and they spend their time in their studio mm-hmm. so that part is really unchanged yeah, I go to my studio every day. It's like I mean, nothing really has changed for me. Yeah, but you, you know, there's also I think as being an artist, you're dependent. Most artists, not all, but are dependent on gallerist or something to sell your work, not mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And and that's up in the air. It Absolutely. makes it harder. And you're like, and I think there's that. Well, this thin, you know, the very few galleries that that you can trust who are actually selling your work has gotten even fewer. Yeah. And that probably will continue to be that way to some extent. Mm-hmm. There'll be some. Uh, well, that's not an easy road to hoe either. Being oh, yeah. <laughs> a gallery. You yeah. Know. No, it's a two tier system right now. If you don't have a way to sell online, uh, it's problematic. Or if you have multiple galleries, I'm sure it would be very difficult. You know, I would be interesting to see what how your father would have handled this situation if he as had, a retailer yeah if yeah. he had one in santa fe and tucson he'd oh be, i think it would be a disaster he'd be like wow oh, what do i do yeah what am i yeah. what's my next step i mean for santa fe we're not going to be in, there's no indian market no spanish market right no folk art right no antique indian shows no opera right you know it's going to be interesting to see how santa fe deals with that yeah how yeah. this all the artists will still be there, but whether they can get to a market is a whole other thing. Yeah, I mean the native artists, if they're not in a gallery, they're in trouble. And in no Indian market, you know. They don't. Know. I've been to it every year for like thirty plus years. I know. I'm still going to be in Santa Fe during that time. I'll let you know, you know, yeah. what it was like. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Maybe people want to get out of cities and come visit, and it could still be very good. And there's not as much competition, but. Hmm. But it's gonna know. change. It's gonna change. Yeah, yeah. Everything changes. Even you, you continue to make different jewelry, and will continue. Don't you find that you continue to experiment? And, oh, constantly. Yeah. That's one of the things I love. There's always something new to learn, something new to try. Do you try different stones and different types of things like that as well? I grew up going to the Tucson Gem Show. Ah, yeah. You know, my grandfather right. didn't have that kind of exposure to colored stones that I've had. Dad has been going to it for as long as it's been running. But mm-hmm. it, I've been working with colored stones a lot more than either of either of them had. Not necessarily in my artwork, though. Mm. I, I come back to turquoise. I love turquoise. It's an addiction. It's a family addiction. So for my artwork, I really stick to turquoise. Mm. Also, I have an end to having rare stones. Right. 
So those are wonderful to work with. Have you ever worked with like dinosaur fossilized thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like a natural that stuff's here, to, you know. Yeah, it's... You should do that for Jim and Merrill's show. Do a dinosaur piece. bone? Yeah, do something like out of fossilized something. Huh. You know, out of fossilized Miramont's... The or, claw. Yeah. Something, yeah, as That'd long as... It's, yeah, I mean, it would be a fun thing to advertise during... Jim and Mineral Show, assuming we still have one for this next January. I still think we'll have something. I'm not sure it'll be what it was. Uh, a lot yeah, of it's that'll open. Be interesting. Well, a lot of it's open air anyway, so uh, I don't think it'll be as. Well, we were joking this last in 2020 in January yeah. about this virus. We were joking about it at that point. It wasn't even here yet, but at yeah. least we didn't know it was. Well, I didn't go this year, and my son didn't go. In fact, he's the one who said you shouldn't go in case coronavirus is coming over. Yeah, I was stuck at the Jogs venue for 15 days. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you should do something in that. And we'll put it out during in, during the uh, Gem and Mineral okay. Show. That would be really fun to have something like that. All right. Yeah. I'll think about it, see yeah. what I can come up with. Yeah, it would be wonderful. There's some beautiful material. Oh, I know. It's fantastic. And I've seen some Navajos have used uh, dinosaur bone huh. before, and it's really beautiful. It has this kind of intricate matrix, and it's yeah, a very yeah. unique. Lots of different colors. Yeah, it's just, well, it's some, but it's well, more but tone, than matrix. Earth tones. It's, it's, yeah, earth tones, and mm -hmm. it's just this crazy matrix, super kind of dense matrix. And there's fossil palm. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. All right. We've... I don't need ideas, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you need sales, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, watch. I need to sit and work. <laughs> I know. Well, and and I appreciate you actually taking the time to to come in today. Oh, this has been a, a lot of fun to have you on. And anything you want to tell jewelers out there who are thinking about going into this business? Um, well, when I get a young person, I just had a guy get in touch with me a couple of weeks ago. He can't, he's been coming to my studio for he's been there three times, and I really start in right away about the business end of it. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, just being uh, more interested in how to maximize the use of the metal because it comes in six-inch wide sheets, so don't design something that's six and a quarter inches long. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, just really simple, basic stuff like that. Think of your market. Where's your market for what you're making? Mm -hmm. How are you going to teach them? So that's how I approach teaching the young people that have interest in going into it as a business. But first I basically tell them they're insane. Yeah. I, I was wondering about that. <laughs> like going into acting. You yeah. Know? What are you crazy? <laughs> well, I think you almost have to really, really want it. Oh yeah. Beyond anything else. Beyond reason actually. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you must see those kids that contact you that do have that passion. I, the guy that I got recently. Yes. But uh, they're, Few and far between mm. also. And I, I had a free young people's class I was teaching before the virus hit. Every Monday from 4 to 6, come in. I will provide everything for you, mm. materials, tools, you know, to remove that as a barrier because it's very expensive to, to buy all the tools mm -hmm. that I use. This is like high school kids? No, most of them are in their 20s. Yeah. Uh, and... You know, you know, none of them are the kind of person that wants to do this as a business. But, you know, a couple of them have really fallen in love with it and are working at home now hmm. and doing neat stuff. It's it's really rewarding. I mean, one guy that wants to be an accountant, I'm like, well, how are you going to go be an accountant when you got this going on? Right. What do you say? Uh, well, he's young enough. He can, you know, be an accountant during the day and come home and do artwork i just do the artwork yeah clearly that guy that's needs smart he, wa he wants the artwork he's letting the other part of his brain dictate that he needs a yeah he's yeah a, well he wants to go into theater accounting so you know he's, <laughs> he's a weirdo anyway it's as close him. as he can and he's get. doing great work yeah he wants to he's doing that because that's the most he can see of doing accounting is still with creative people yeah he's an artist yeah if yeah. you're listening whoever you may be yeah. you're an artist just you know, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and so will that begin, will that open up again at some point where you'll have... I'd love to. You know, every Monday at four, I'd be like, oh, God, I should have canceled this class. I don't want to be here. But they come in and 
I have a blast with, yeah. with them, and it's really run and gun. I've, my teaching style is to, not to teach, a, we're going to make this today. My teaching style is to tell me what you want to do. Here's materials. What can you do? And I'll help you put it together. I'll show you. I'll demonstrate the techniques that you need to, to use to assemble this thing. And, you know, that's how I teach. Mm. Even my, my older paying students, that's how I teach. And I guess you'll wait until the virus gets to where it's manageable before you do any of that again, huh? Yeah, it's really an unknown right now. Yeah. So I, I have no idea how to do this. I look at what the states put out, which actually seems fairly reasonable. Mm-hmm. I agree. But it's, you know, we're all just feeling our way through this. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we're keeping the galley close to the month. Yeah, of I had May. A, I had somebody call me the other day and said, "Are you open? I yeah. want to buy my wife something. Or can I have it by Friday?" And I'm like, <laughs> uh, uh, "What do you mean open? No, I'm I'm sitting in my studio with the lights all off because I don't want to pay for electricity." Yeah. <laughs> And I was completely unhelpful. Yeah. And after I hung up, I was like, what was I doing? I, you know. Well, you weren't expecting it. No, I yeah. was <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what our plan is, just to stay by appointment only through the end of May. And then if it's still a problem, end of June, well, I'll just do it every month until I feel it's comfortable enough for my clients and my staff. Yeah, and if it comes back, we're all back to... I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll put my medical hat back on and, and look at the data. I think that's what we all have to do is look at the numbers. Yes, so, I wish we would do that as a nation. It's very difficult, and I understand that if you're losing I your job. I see that, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's one... Yeah, it's very difficult. But yeah, it is. At least for us, that's how we're going to do it. So, yeah. And we I think the Italians were able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. They're, they're not a feely. law-abiding country. Yeah. I heard this on NPR. <laughs> we're a country of people who are not always trying to get around the laws. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they didn't want to die. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting time. Mm-hmm. Well, on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I, you so much for yeah, this opportunity. Th- yeah, Mark. no, very, very great to have. It's nice to hear the backstory of, of what's going on. And we'll try to put in some examples maybe in the YouTube part of this so you can great, see some great. of the cartouches and things like that so people can yeah, actually yeah. see what we're talking about when we're talking about the different Thank time you. frames yeah. for the senior, junior, and then the, the, the youngest, Sam. <laughs> who's not so young anymore, no, no. 40 plus years of making yep. silver. You're really yep. kind of at your, probably your peak of, you know, I think people kind of hit their peak between 45 and 70. You really. know, I can really work when I sit down to work. Yeah, I can yeah. get it done. Yeah, it's reflexive. As long as I have the ideas. That's yeah, it's pretty much part. reflexive at this point, yeah. right? Yeah. right. I love that. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful when you it reach is. that it is. that point in your life and you can just go, oh, yeah, I'm doing this. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, he brought us some new work, and uh, we'll have that all online. Maybe I'll have it all come out about the same time this podcast does. Thank you. Sam Patania. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you, Mark. Uh-huh. Excellent. That was fun. Yeah, I knew that. You are a good interviewer. Well, I like what I, I really enjoy. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.